So now for something rather different. Um, I'm going to be talking about carceral economy, the locked door in the domestic novel. In Madness and Civilization, Michel Foucault describes the great confinement of the 17th century, the confinement of the insane. The project is not medical. Foucault, Foucault calls it semi-judicial, an extension of the police, the maintenance of public order. But a moral perception sustains and animates it, he says. What governs it is the ethical imperative of labor. Madness is first identified as an inability to work. The 18th century also saw a great confinement. The confinement of women of the property classes to the home. This development is also semi-judicial, but here it is founded on the interdiction of labor, the exclusion of women from the workplace. Again, it is informed by a moral perception, but it was instrumented by civil law. While in the Middle Ages, women could hold property in their own right, engage in business contracts, and compete with men as equals in a range of trades, by the 1700s, these economic rights had been revoked for the most part, and marriage was one of the very few legal occupations open to women. Marriage made the legal enclosure of middle and upper class women complete. In his commentaries on the laws of England, the jurist William Blackstone defines the principle of coverture. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. Among the real consequences of this metaphor of covering are the following. The husband takes control of the whole of his wife's property, past, present, and future. He has sole rights over their children. A married woman may not enter into any legal agreement or lawsuit on her own behalf. She cannot bring proceedings against her husband in common law. And since her very being as a legal subject is suspended, she no longer holds property in her own person, locks minimum condition for civil rights. The ultimate justification for the doctrine of coverture could be found in the New Testament. Husband and wife shall be one flesh. So in law, they become one, and the husband was that one. Consequently, in common law, uh, marriage meant what has been called a kind of civil death for women. The married woman, legally speaking, haunts the home to which she is confined. The modifications to the legal status of women class them with children, idiots, lunatics, irresponsibles, I'm quoting here. And as in the case of Foucault's great confinement, the privatizing of women is tied to the expansion of the cities and the establishment of a bourgeois order. In the city, trade work is, is uh, capitalized. Trades are detached from the household economy and the women of the trading class is excluded by more rigid codes of practice, and notably by more inflexible hours of work, incompatible with childbearing and child rearing. What else is new? Um, bourgeois women, having been made economically superfluous, become the symbolic excess of the economic, which must be segregated and contained. So this is the form of a newly delineated private sphere. Previously, a private person, male or female, was anyone who had their place outside the realm of, of public affairs at court or in parliament. Now women became the representatives of the private, of home and leisure distinct from public business. While men internalize the div division between private and public, 
as a split between personhood, a corollary of leisure, and external necessity, the need to earn a living. We find these two projects of confinement on the basis of madness and on the basis of sex combined in the Gothic fiction of Anne Radcliffe or the Victorian sensation novels of Mary Braddon and Wilkie Collins. But today I'm going to be talking about a different novelistic tradition, the domestic novel, which begins in the 1740s with Samuel Richardson and his novels Pamela and Clarissa, most of my references are going to be to these two works, and continues into the 19th century with Jane Austen and the Brontes. This tradition will be of interest to anyone concerned with the way subjectivity is shaped within domestic space. Uh, but Richardson in particular is a central reading, or this is what I'm going to claim. Um, nowhere, I think, is the interplay of mind and architecture more fully elaborated. My discussion will begin with a short history of the locked door. Indoor locks were an innovation of the period. In the fictions of Richardson, they are cause for reflection and delight. In part two of Pamela, for instance, the maidservant heroine, having married her master, writes with rapture of the improvements he plans for one of his properties. The parlor doors are to have brass hinges and locks and to shut as close as a watch case. The ability to create islands out of the otherwise fluid space of the household interior has taken the pleasures of privacy into new realms. But the transition of the home from public to private was by no means complete in the mid 18th century when Richardson was writing. The absence of corridors, the persistence of ranges of connected rooms, meant that integrity of space was not yet elevated to a ruling principle. But the move towards privacy and the symbolic feminization of the home was underway. And it was as if in recognition of this fact that the dining room began to function like a last ditch assertion of masculine monopoly within increasingly feminized surroundings. After din dinner, the, uh, the women departed to the drawing or withdrawing room to prepare the tea, while the men remained to glory in their exclusivity, their absolute dominion for an hour or so before rejoining the women. Every meal was thus made a performance of sexual division. The vanquishing of the feminine, the triumph of the masculine, French travelers to England were amazed by the barbarism of the custom. But if anything, it served chiefly to highlight the vulnerable status of men in the home. Here they are partially strangers, subject to conflicting imperatives, whereas women are always at home. Whether in the dining room or the drawing room, the behavior of women was expected to remain consistent. The behavior of men, on the other hand, was subject to radical alteration. In the dining room, there is men among men, released from constraint, supposedly at ease with themselves, and ease to be flaunted and exaggerated by the practice of serious drinking. In the drawing room, in contrast, they must obey the codes of deportment demanded by mixed company. It is the difference between nature and nurture, the spontaneous and the civilized. The male personality bears the burden of this difference and negotiates the symbolic distance between the two rooms as a form of self-division. Women are self-identical, on the other hand, the emblems of one term in this division. It is woman's nature to be nurtured she is spontaneously civilized. <coughs> the privatizing process altered sleeping arrangements as well. Separate chambers became the norm for members of the family and sometimes for servants. Though Pamela suggests a certain amount of same sex bed hopping amongst servants uh, still. The pragmatics of isolation were dealt with by a more general distribution of fireplaces throughout the house, including the bedrooms. It became feasible 
and even desirable to stay in a, in a bedchamber all day long and use it as a living as well as a sleeping area. It also meant that the bedchamber could be turned into a comfortable prison. It was on the doors of bedchambers that Locke's first featured prominently. It was in the bedchamber that privacy began its campaign of appropriation. The Locke introduces discontinuity into the house. Absolute obstruction turns the closed door into the sign of an absolute will to solitude. The house is psychologized. Its material existence is no longer definitive. The layout of the interior enters into flux. Its outline and limits are no longer secure. Thresholds appear and vanish. Impenetrable rooms are of interest, not because they contain a secret necessarily or a precious object, but because they shelter a soul. A lock is the equivalent of a sign hung on the door handle, soul at work, do not disturb. This is emphatically the message conveyed by the various locked doors that serve to reinforce the moral integrity of Clarissa in Richard's no Richardson's novel. Loveless, her abductor and would-be violator, recognizes fully the identification of mind and door. Within the London house where he has shut her up, uh, she has created a sanctuary in her private chamber from which he is excluded. Loveless insists that by this exclusion, it is he who is made a prisoner. Clarissa's door is almost always shut. He waits below, straining to catch a sound that will indicate her state of mind and he hopes a softening of her will. He writes to, uh, to a, a correspondent, and now I hear the rusty hinges of my beloved's door give me creaking invitation. My heart creaks and throbs with respondent trepidations. Whimsical enough though, for what relation has a lover's heart to a rusty pair of hinges? But they are the hinges that open and shut the door of my beloved's bedchamber. Relation enough in that. In more than one letter to his confidant, the uh, fellow rake Jack Belford, Loveless describes the riot of speculation he suffers when he hears the lady's door unbar, unlock, unbolt. These verbs never come singly. It is always unbar, unbolt, unlock, and open suggesting a heroic degree of containment and exclusion in keeping with the noble dimensions of Clarissa's moral being. This is the point, perhaps, I wish to distinguish between locks and bolts. Bolts, of course, are relatively crude instruments. They must be either inside or outside. They can only perform one role in the drama. They obey one master. Compare the promiscuity of keys. It is the lock and key that makes the door a truly ambiguous feature. Control of the threshold depends not on location, inside and outside, but on possession of a key that can be anywhere or nowhere. And the nature of the inner space must obviously change with the passage of the key. The bolt can trump the lock. On one occasion towards the beginning of the story, Clarissa is reassured by the thought that although Loveless may have a key to the door of her summer house, there is an inside bolt that she can use to keep him out. On another occasion, towards the end of the story, when Clarissa is taken under false pretenses to a debtor's prison, she is horrified by the absence of an indoor and inside bolt. This has been her principal, most reliable security throughout. So she sits up in a chair all night with the back against the door and a broken piece of a poker thrust through the staples where the bolt had been. This is the stage at which the confinement of women comes to resemble most closely the confinement of the insane, when ideology is reinforced by a bolt on the other side of the door. But there is a dialectic at work in Richardson's incarcerations. On the one hand, women are treated like lunatics. They're coerced, 
restrained, their wishes and representations are ignored. On the other, the very treatment which seems to equate femaleness and lunacy is the condition of an inner life, which eventually gathers force as a, as a powerful form of resistance. This may go some way towards explaining the logic of Clarissa's mysterious and urgent request to Lovelace after he has succeeded in raping her, that she be locked up in some private madhouse, never more to be seen or to be produced to anyone. There is a sense in which the more completely the self is confined, absented from the public scene, the greater its power to overcome circumstance. In both novels, Clarissa and Pamela, Richardson seems concerned to emphasize the way locks and bolts enable women to control space. No literal lock is ever forced in Richardson. True in his works, this control appears to be primarily defensive, a resistance to external threats. I'll be modifying this view in a moment. But potentially, the use of locks permit, permits a form of control which is not tied to physical strength and is therefore not the privilege of men. The potential is fulfilled, for instance, in a scene from Wuthering Heights in which Kathy forces a confrontation between Heathcliff and her husband Edgar Linton by slamming the door of the kitchen, locking it, and after a struggle with Linton, throwing the key into the fireplace. The scene is overdetermined. At once it shows the power of a woman to physically confine men. It symbolizes the influence of a woman's will over the more flexible and suggestible natures of men. And finally, by the surrendering of the key to the flames in order to maintain this control, it predicts where any narrative of female power will end in a self-annihilation which achieves the more perfect because immaterial control of other minds through memory. Both Kathy and Clarissa die after starving themselves. I won't have time to elaborate on this point. I would in any case refer you to Maud Elman's recent book, The Hunger Artist. But I will be returning uh, to the end of Clarissa after an investigation of her origins in the closet. So far I've been talking about the bedchamber as the principal locus of privacy. But this space contains another space which is yet more private, the closet, a characteristic feature of the Georgian house a small private apartment usually adjoining the bedroom. The closet is generically feminine, the counterpart of the masculine library or study. It is a place of contemplative isolation, a place for activities of the mind. Its seclusion distinguished from that of the bedroom by the absence of a bed with its distractingly bodily associations. So what did a closet contain? Ian Watt in The Rise of the Novel replies, typically it stores not china and preserves, but books, a writing desk, and a standish. It is the early version of the room of one's own, which Virginia Woolf saw as the prime requisite of woman's emancipation. And it was much more characteristically the locus of woman's liberty and even license than its French equivalent, the boudoir, for it was used not to conceal gallons, but to lock them out. Watt calls the closet a forcing house of the feminine sensibility. In the domestic novels of Richardson, closets feature largely, as do the paraphernalia of pens, papers, and sealing wax. These are, after all, novels in letter form, and writing is the principal activity of the heroines. But what essentially turns the closet into a forcing house of feminine sensibility is not the contents of the closet. The physical characteristics of such a room are scarcely registered in fiction. It is the time available to be spent there. The closet is space transmuted into time which is itself subordinated to mind. 
The most important feature of the closet, perhaps it's only really Im important feature, is its lock. The lock is a guarantee of the private time out of which selfhood is constituted. The time which has been forcibly diverted from the world of work is channeled into this haven of active leisure and into the inward directed pastimes of the closet. Although the genteel woman was required to be private, this privacy created anxiety in, in, in the general culture. The many conduct books written in the 18th century focus on the perils of leisure. Charity is recommended as a form of pseudo work, but reading, apart from the reading of devotional works perhaps, is generally discouraged. Novels especially are severely condemned. They would derange the imagination, create unreasonable expectations, make the reader dissatisfied with reality. Pamela and Clarissa are frequently ac accused by their male oppressors of having a head filled with romance when they attempt to resist the scenarios laid out for them. They are also accused of futile scribbling. And again, this is because of the connection between writing and resistance to male authority. As events happen, they record them. It is within the confines of the closet that Richardson's hero heroines write their letters, giving an ongoing narrative of their persecutions. Even when there is no possibility that the letters will reach their destinations, they carry on writing. What is important is that they sustain this personal account, this projection of self as subject into a plot in which they are intended by others to play the part only of object. And eventually this writing doubles back and seizes hold of events. The complete narrative in letters is assembled. The heroine is vindicated. Corrupt authority is forced to capitulate. Pamela and Clarissa are histories of closet rebellions. And the victory of reflective subjectivity over convention backed by force. They bear witness to the revolutionary potential of women's time, time detached from social function and channeled through the solitude of a locked room. Um, to begin to conclude, I want to say that the message of the domestic novel is this. To be female is to be human. This is perhaps something we've all suspected. <laughs> In the domestic novel, a model of subjective existence is presented which owes everything to the exclusion from work and to enforced leisure and privacy. The sense of self which evolves in absolute seclusion is a female self. No doubt the equation of femaleness and humanness is a source of cultural instability. This must certainly be so. Uh, since the lady of leisure leads an existence that is both abject and privileged. The fiction of Richardson, for one, is in part an attempt to overcome this instability through a policy of mind over matter. An episode can illustrate it. When Lovelace finally has his way with Clarissa, gains access to her room and by the logic of metaphor to her person, it is because she is drugged her mind is absent, in other words. The chamber is unlocked because it is uninhabited. Another more general example is the letters out of which the novels themselves are constructed with their amazing ability to make physical confinement a merely notional state. Writing materials pass into the locked chamber and letters pass out in a way which is scarcely credible, if not supernatural. Within the narrative, letters routinely transgress the spatial boundaries of public and private. And at a meta-narrative level, the letter is the private made public, closeted ruminations revealed to the gaze of a reading public. What we have is a private sense of self with a constant tendency to pass through its containing walls 
and permeate external spaces. It is as if the more absolute the confinement, the more pervasive the subsequent leakage. In Richardson, the role of the letter as the emblem and vehicle of the spread from private into public is very concrete and motivated. We can see the same pattern, the private word made public, in novels by Charlotte Bronte, though in a more abstract form. Jane Eyre and Villette are extended monologues without specific occasion, the spiritual autobiographies of their heroines. And in both cases, spiritual conquest begins in confinement, behind locked doors, and in the self-consciousness that, that is cultivated there before moving on to be manifested in co-option of the full range of domestic space. Locks bring about transformation in Bronte's novels. Jane Eyre's childhood experience of being locked up in the haunted red room consolidates the tenacious self-identity which will eventually make her the mistress of Thornfield Hall and the keeper of Mr. Rochester. Lucy Snow in Villette is briefly imprisoned in the attic of the pension where she teaches to memorize the part of a male rake uh, in a melodrama and undergoes a personal metamorphosis as a result of her performance. What I felt that night and what I did, I no more expected to feel and do than to be lifted in a trance to seventh heaven. The sequence from the solitary and lofty attic to seventh heaven, to undivided possession of her own schoolhouse, is mapped in advance. It is the same path as the heroines of Richardson had taken. They too come out of the closet to conquer the world. Pamela achieves a worldly ascendancy by marriage to the master who had planned to seduce her. It is her letters it is her letters, rather, the text woven out of her isolation, the written evidence of her flawless interiority that bring about this miracle. By reading her collected letters, the master is forced to recognize her as his moral superior and resolves to make her private writings the textbook of his future conduct. The house where she was held against her will and where her only refuge was the closet to which she held the key is now all her own. She concludes, my prison has become my palace. The problem with this ending is the problem with marriage as the reward of virtue. <coughs> it just isn't good enough. Simply the exchange of one set of constraints for another. Pamela part two, which shows the heroine's dismal married life makes this clear enough. Richardson himself saw the problem and arranged a happier ending for the heroine of Clarissa, death. Some people think Clarissa is a tragedy. This is obviously wrong. When the heroine's coffin is returned to her father's house and installed in the parlor from which she had previously been wrongfully evicted for filial disobedience, when it lies there in state, surrounded by weeping and repentant relatives, we know that everything has gone according to plan. We have witnessed Clarissa planning for death with meticulous care, ordering the coffin in advance, arranging for it to be decorated with symbols and inscriptions. Her final letter, her final letter in other words, the coffin itself, a message from the other side, from inside. Here we see the inverse proportion of spatial enclosure and the powers of the externalizing private mind at its most radical extreme. Clarissa's entry into her most cramped quarters yet coincides with her maximum influence over the minds of others and her reappropriation of domestic space where her, she had been first marginalized and then excluded. Ultimate containment gives rise to omnipresence. The fact that she's no longer alive is a side issue. What matters is the survival of Clarissa's perfect humanity as example. 
memorialized in her closet correspondence to be internalized by the readers, both fictional and real. The notion of the evasion of privacy is in effect turned on its head. It's privacy that invades. The psychology of the house culminates here. It can go no further. Thank you. Yes, that's an interesting idea, actually, that work is excluded from the novel as women are excluded from work. Um, well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a general cultural fact, isn't it? Rather than something that's invented in the novel, this division between a masculine public sphere and a feminine public sphere. Mm -hmm. So these are bourgeois novels, true. <laughs> it's quite possible to work women to work out there. Thanks for that. Yeah, I don't quite get the drift of your I began with the scenario of the eighteenth century and the growing mm -hmm. sense of uh, security of domestic privacy. And I thought, well, isn't maybe at the same time it's working somehow the also a privatizing factory, or rather publicized in fact. But you can't say Yes, well, I, I think that the, the rise of the novel is certainly very much connected with this division of spheres, and it falls on the side of the feminine and the private. That's its principal concern, and the domestic novel is the major novel form. So it shares in, in the kinds of separations that I've been talking about, yeah. What was that to the American Dickens novel that you can read kind of equivalent? Genders of rooms, I suppose, reflected in texts like uh, The Gentleman's House. In that sense, it's still alive and well in the 1860s. To what extent is that still, uh, is, is the transformation of the house and the way in which one might have gender different kinds of rooms? To what extent is that true of the, the novel after the 1880s? I mean, the house changes radically in the 1880s. East Lake's house, hints on house mm -hmm. of taste reshaping of the house. Is that reflected soon after in novels? In the 1880s, I think I'm going to have to well, please not, not, <laughs> <laughs> not my area. I'm going to have to please not my area. It's not something I've looked into, but uh, I don't know what it could be. But what interests me in this uh, invention of uh, privacy, private space, etc., isn't it that what interests me is that at the same time, crime, which of course existed before, but Crime becomes precisely something, I would almost, crime precisely as a, okay, in a naive sense, some private, uh, intimate, that becomes, but isn't it exactly at the same time, crime becomes, is invented as a public performance, to put it this way. So, almost the opposite movement, and what interests me in this novel is the problem <coughs> of crime, I simply don't know enough, is it, uh, how is it uh, gender specified? Do only women cry, I mean, in the novels, or I think that also men cry? They are allowed to cry, no? Oh, certainly. And this is a great, a great age of men's tears. Um, I think they're making something of a comeback. Um, if I remember rightly, there was a program about it just the other day. Um, but 
Um, yes, I mean, it shows the compulsion to demonstrate humanity in this period, that it's such a, it's such a new notion and so exclusively constructed in terms of gender. Um, yes, it's very important that men, I think this is certainly part of the same phenomenon, that men, that men show that they have, they have learned the lesson of um, this interiority created in the home um, by the woman in her closet. I mean, it's through, it's through reading novels, for instance. I mean, Rousseau, you, you, you know the, uh, the passage from the Confessions where um, he and his father sit over novels crying their eyes out. Um, this is where he learns his sensibility. And um, yeah, certainly. <laughs> At the moment when it's, it becomes a problem, when it seems that uh, um, this is something that men are going to possibly miss out on um, if they're confined to the public sphere alone. They have to show that they partake of the private. It has to be demonstrated. I have a feeling, actually, that, that if there are no more kind of specific questions, but nonetheless, a number of issues around gender have come up in this talk, which in the discussion afterwards, you know, we might feed in uh, to the more directly architectural questions. I think at the moment, they're sort of in two different parts of the day, and maybe in the discussion we could bring them together. So thank you very much indeed.